This is Film Tank. Tank, tank, tank. This is Film Tank. After this, there is no turning back. You know, we're sitting here like a couple of regular fellas. We're going to make film history. Can you say that again? Just the way you say it. Baby, it's time to lose their head. They won't know what they're looking at or why they like it, but they'll know. Again, Film Tank friends, and welcome in to episode 207 of our little podcast we like to call Film Tank. As uh, per usual, Alex Diekman here with you, along with uh, my other usual co-host, Nick Cheney. Am I not pretty enough? Is my heart too broken? <sighs> That's all I got. I was going to say, sing it, sister. Oh, uh, well, you know what? Actually, there was a time when I could sing pretty much that song verbatim, like the week I watched this movie for the first time. Because <laughs> uh, uh, just a little little anecdote here really quick. Sure. But I watched this for the first time earlier this year with a friend of the podcast, Sarah from Minnesota. And I was staying over at her place. And the next day, anytime, like, she has a uh, a Chromecast on her main TV in the living room, right? Okay. So, like, I could be in the bedroom or in the bathroom, and I would just go to YouTube and find the Casey Chambers music video for that goddamn song <laughs> and, and just press play and have the TV start blaring it when she was, like, trying to make breakfast or something. And uh, That sounds entirely like something you would do. Oh, yeah. And it, I think, both annoyed and got a chuckle from both uh, – Sarah and her wonderful fiance Andy, who puts up with a lot of shit, considering uh, he's very okay with me basically kind of taking over the schedule for three days in a row, like three or four times a year. So, yeah, uh, if you want to annoy a friend, just start playing the song over and over. I could easily see why anybody would be annoyed uh, by that song being played over and over. But, you know, that song is like a hit in Australia. Like, Casey Chambers is Mm -hmm. like pretty much like a top 20 pop you know sensation over in that country so like if you look at like when i google just to find the music video if you uh you just get these countless like australia's got talent performances where little girls are singing this song and whatnot and (laughs) anyway it's a bizarro land over there first kangaroos and now casey chambers (laughs) that's the that's the threshold right right there They've done it. The first kangaroos. Yep. That's great. Our soupials of melancholy. <laughs> so uh, the film we're going to eventually get to is an Australian film. That's good that it is because that would have been quite the segue into we're talking about a Finnish film. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and we mentioned kangaroos. Mm-hmm. But no, uh, the Australian horror film The Loved Ones uh, that was released 10 years ago in 2009 is the film yeah. we're going to be covering on our main segment on this Ten episode. 10 year anniversary this year. I didn't think about that. It doesn't, uh, just watching it, it doesn't really feel like a film that's 10 years old. No. I mean, even like the some of the antiquated technology, I could see these characters just having even in 2019. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's aged very well. I would uh, concur. And uh, this was the first time I had ever sat down to watch this film uh, earlier this evening as Nick... Uh, had suggested this as a film to talk about on our uh, last October episode to close out the uh, horror movie slate, which we only only did two. We did this in American Werewolf in London. But we released them in October. I know. So technically speaking, it's kind of a win. And even if this is released on, like, the 2nd of November, like, it is way closer because I went back and this is, like, a sad moment. (laughs) And I was going back and looking at some of our old episodes a while ago. And I saw the like the Halloween Horror Nights episode from 2018 mm. was released in January yep. of this year. I was like, that's ah, a shame. We got that out our this year's Halloween before that was like even in its like 
like peak season, I think. Yeah, I was going to so, say it was in early October. That's pretty so, good. I uh, this is the best run we've been on since Boom. I got a full time job. <laughs> so, and and that was like four years ago. So you know what? It only took us two hundred episodes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, okay. In reality. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the editing and timing effort uh, that I put in when I was still working part time and looking for a full time job, I did have more time on my hands. Uh, so these were uh, tidied up and released a little quicker. And, uh, you know, over the last, oh, say three and a half years, it's kind of slipped a little bit. But I. By all of us. I mean, even when yeah. you were like, you start slipping and then therefore. It, whatever, and then I have them in the Dropbox, and then it's my turn to actually post them, mm-hmm. but then because I slip after you slip, and then it just became a very slippery slope. Absolutely. Uh, the other member of our little uh, three-headed gang here. Our other loved one. <laughs> uh, Tucson Egan, not able to make it for this episode, but he's planning to rejoin us next week, and... Uh, I guess we'll mention it again probably before the end of the episode, but our friend Sam is going to join us next week, sure. and uh, we're going to talk about a classic movie, mm-hmm. uh, so that's mm-hmm. going to be uh, fun to look forward to, uh, and we'll talk about that again before the end of this episode. Justice will be served. Absolutely. Well, yep. <laughs> Maybe that was a tease. Yeah. We're going to do an episode on a, another DC movie. Oh, fuck. <laughs> You'd actually probably be okay with that since... Seems- actually, yeah, I am slightly... Of becoming a DC fanboy these days, so I was going to say I feel like you definitely prefer DC's what they're currently doing to what Marvel is currently doing. That is correct. Like while I totally agree that the baseline of competence is squarely in Marvel's court, mm-hmm. uh, I will take the just bizarre failures and like outlier high points of DC as of right now. Uh, now, it started off really bad. It did. Because, like, Man of Steel is one of the worst superhero movies ever made. I would agree. Ooh. I kind of want to rewatch it um, because I haven't quite watched it since I got into DC. Sure. A- a- whatever. I don't know that I would dislike it as much as I actually dislike Suicide Squad at this point. Because at least from what I remember, and I remember Man of Steel being awful... <laughs> I at least there felt like there was some semblance of, if not understanding the comics, at least trying to present something. I don't know. At least in the first hour, like, like I, I said, I really have to rewatch it. I just remember it being so dull. I mean, I remember that too, yeah. and I certainly would not necessarily look forward to. <laughs> re- there, there's like a tier right now of these DC movies as like movies I want to rewatch just to remember what happened, and that would be Man of Steel. Movies I kind of want to rewatch because I wouldn't say I was, I'm going to become favorable towards it, but I will say I probably will not hate it as much, which would be Batman v Superman, just because I like Batman now. And We can go back and rewatch the three-hour cut again. Well, if you're not present, I probably will watch the three-hour cut because, I mean, if I'm going to spend two and a half hours or something. Might as I, well go all the way. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. And then there's actually just good movies that I haven't actually seen since the theater, like Wonder Woman. So... But yeah, I just re uh, rewatch. I guess it wasn't the whole thing. I just rewatched the last I don't know forty five minutes of that, and it's still good. Yeah, it is a nice little film. We didn't come here to talk about comic book movies, though. No, we did not. No, but we're no. gonna anyway. No, no. <laughs> we're like Martin Scorsese. We we just want to get out, and we don't want to talk, talk about, theme about park movies. We don't want to talk about these anymore. Although I gotta say, hmm. I feel like he's trolling us a little bit because he commented on it again earlier because this week. people keep asking him about it. I See, know. That's the thing about but... commenting on and reacting to. Like, his very first original thing was not him going on okay. a diatribe. But he had... Oh, but the all... discourse is now against him, so of course he's going to make a statement. I was going to say, this... I have to slightly disagree with you because... This and not, I'm not talking about his stance on it. Mm. I'm referring more to this most recent statement he made. What was which, that actually? Could I kind well, of... he clearly picked somebody to come and ask him about it mm. because he had this like three paragraph prepared response to oh, it, yeah. and it was like, Pfft. so <laughs> it's better than fucking Bob Iger saying. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying. Oh, it's, oh, it's... these are real movies. Have you seen Black Panther? Have you seen Black Panther? That was a bad 
moment for him. Actually, they've all been bad moments for oh, all of the my people gosh, involved yes. in Marvel. That is not looking great. But Martin Scorsese is not. Uh, let's just let's just. Um, I guess let me just say that he's he's not aiding this story dying. He, no, he's definitely continuing to give it oxygen. I mean, I will agree that he's certainly perpetuating it at this point. However. If he hadn't have made whatever statement he made, which I actually haven't even read yet, mm-hmm. uh, the last word is that Martin Scorsese says he needs to stay in his lane. So I kind of understand him being a little grumpy gills and uh, saying like, "Well, you know, whatever he said." But I don't well, know. he also tried to have both have it both ways because he tried to have a like compromise type answer, which is fine. But again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At a certain point, you either just don't like them and you should just stick to it, or which he kind of like he kind of tries to have it both ways, and it's just not. But he also wants to work again. Yeah, which I feel like he's someone who could come out of this unscathed, oh, no problem, absolutely, no yeah. matter what he says. True. So that's why it's so crazy to me that people are so like, like you you already won the culture wars, like. Superhero movies are here to reign over, so if one old man who had a cocaine problem back in the seventies doesn't like your superhero and tights movies, like I think that's a that's an okay uh compromise. You would think so, but not in this climate. And it's just so weird that people get so attached to like like if Paul Thomas Anderson for me, right? If he came out and said something like He name dropped Paul Thomas Anderson in did his he? quote, yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but if he came out and said something like he when he made Boogie Nights, he only made that because he thought the porn industry was awful and there was no artistic value in any of the movies made during that, I wouldn't then go, No, Paul Remember what you did. Like, we were on the same page, Paul. Like, I don't know. It's just they, these are human beings. And the idea that they're going to have the same beliefs as you just because you like their stuff is just bad. Who cares, yeah. too? That's, that's, that's the part of it that is just yeah. continues to boggle my mind. And I know that <laughs> a lot of this is perpetuated by sites attempting to get clicks and that oh, kind yeah. of thing. but. Boy, who really cares about and any of this? if you really want to draw a line between when it matters, when a person speaks up or something like that, at least draw it between the medium uh, interactions. For example, if you said something like Grant Morrison or Chris, uh, Chris Claremont, two very prominent comics writer, had something to say about a comic book movie or the comic book movie industry at, at large, fine, like, let's hear it. You can disagree or agree, but that would be worth saying because that's something they created that is now being morphed into something else. But the guy who got famous for making extremely dark, toxic, masculine films about gangsters and criminals and whatnot, uh, yeah, what, I mean, whether he, even if he liked Marvel, what would that prove? Like, (laughs) he's never going to make something like that because he's clearly not interested in that. So it's not like that would be a ringing endorsement, Uh, just the same way that it's not really all that much of a rebuff because it's not for him. So, anyway. Right, just like many things are not for everybody. I agree. So, yeah, the whole thing's just just annoying but really we've, we, we we've pervades all of our episodes yeah anyway, i was gonna say we've covered this on like three consecutive episodes but at the same time it just continues to just pop up every now and then in the 48 hours news cycle culture that we live in this just continues to just be a story for whatever reason ain't that the truth <laughs> So, before we get to the uh, horror film, The Loved Ones, that we're going to discuss, uh, and even though we've talked about horror films in general previously on this podcast in the past, I thought it'd be fun just to chat a little bit about some of our favorite slash least favorite things, specifically about uh, this genre that I would have to say, even though I don't really like them, I think you and myself, Nick, have actually come around on the horror genre quite a bit it, to different degrees. Yeah, no, but um, but I when think we, we were very roughly in the same place when this when this podcast started. Uh, that yep. That where is, we definitely had watched a few things, and we certainly had a few things that we liked, mm-hmm. but that was like it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think either of us was ever seeking out horror films. Yeah. 
or um, or even allowing it to become part of a certain diet, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. And now you are, <laughs> I would say, a horror fan yep. for sure. Uh, and I am more. I, I think the big uh, sign that I am more a fan of certain horror is that I am now at times choosing to watch yeah. horror films uh, on my own uh, where like I've always enjoyed watching them in a group setting at least right. specific films but like last night uh, and even though it is not like uh, you know dark horror film uh, wanted to see if Emily wanted to watch a horror film which she doesn't really like them yeah. so, I had so to what did you watch? Uh, we watched A Quiet Place, ah. uh, and it was the first time I had seen it since the theater, yeah. uh, and I actually uh, very much still agree with my early assessments of it, where I think it is a fantastic film uh, that definitely has some parts of it that are not good. Yeah, no, I watched it last Halloween uh, mm-hmm. at home because I know it didn't come out. It came out like during the summer, I think. Yeah. Um, so that was the first and the last time since then. But when I was looking for a movie to watch with my parents who are, well, at least my mother does not like horror that much. Mm-hmm. I had to think about something that was not crazy scary, but also would actually fill the quota of being like a scary whatever. And I chose that, and the entire household uh, was very appreciative. I was going to say, I think it fits the bill, because it definitely falls on the line of, like, definitely science fiction. Uh, and also, too, there's other elements as well, as it's for sure a genre bender. Uh, but at the same time, like, at the end of the day, like, it is definitely a horror film. Uh, and it, um, yeah, I still think it's very good. And there are some parts of it that I just don't understand. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So there were four things that I brought up that are pretty, you know, simple, basic questions about horror. And again, we may have covered these in some capacity, but I thought it would be fun just to put them down yeah. uh, on the record. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I just want to start. I off. swear. Oh, look at you! You even got a Bible there and everything. Where did you find that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I thought it would be really fun just to start with the very simple, what is your favorite horror movie? And I came up with three answers because I can never decide. Wait, that's your first question? <laughs> yeah. I do, I'm sorry, this was very technical, behind the scenes, film tank stuff. I have four questions here, and not one of them is what is my favorite horror movie. Oh, boy. Okay. I'm just, I okay. really... Well, okay, so I Not had, that I can't answer that no, question. No, no, so I had uh, the four... I, I, I'm more interested in what your fourth question is now because I had four and I sent them to you exactly how I wrote them down. And here. I copied and pasted. I know. So, so okay, so I had favorite horror movie, okay. favorite horror icon, uh-huh. favorite horror movie trope, uh-huh. and least favorite horror movie. Okay. So what was the fourth that you had? So I have yep. three of those are the same. Yep. But something has gotten to switch because I have favorite horror icon, favorite horror movie moment. Okay. Favorite horror movie trope okay. and least favorite horror movie. Okay. So what the hell? Uh, so I think we could do five categories. Okay. Then. So we're going to start with favorite horror movie. I think we should because I'll, 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 I'll need to think on the horror movie moment since okay. I did not write anything down for that. Well, I, I did because I know, you, you asked me. I know. Well, okay. Well, we were on the same page. You know what? We're on the same page. This is, this is magic right here. Boom. This we got good. this. Okay. So. I came up with three options for a favorite horror movie, Whoa. and uh, I could not decide on one, but I think these all are pretty different, so that's why I landed on all of them. Okay. So the three films I uh, decided for my favorite horror film that I could think of were uh, the original Psycho mm-hmm. by Alfred Hitchcock, mm-hmm. uh, Saw 2, mm-hmm. And uh, the Rob Zombie second Halloween film. Ah, yes. That's a great movie. It is actually very good. Uh, yeah. uh, and I think one of the reasons why I liked it so much uh, was because I was not expecting to like it as much as I did. So it just really just pushed me over the edge. Um, and I've definitely been meaning to revisit that and also the first uh, zombie Halloween film because I thought that was decent as well. But... Overall, that's just such a fun, different movie that um, I don't really understand why people think that's terrible. Because so, some people are stupid. Eh, that's okay. They probably like Marvel movies. 
Uh, uh, Saw 2, I absolutely love the ending to that, and I think that is such an important part of that film, is I think the surprise ending to Saw 2 is actually, like, miles better than the first film. And even though I like the original, and I like the ending of the first film, and I think it's fun, I think it is definitely more telegraphed than the second film, which has this incredible knockout surprise ending that I remember seeing it the first time I was like blown away that that was what the ending of the film was. Yeah. So I think that, and the, and the rest of the film is actually quite good too. Um, and then the, you know, whole pull of the film that it's not happening at the same time. Uh, obviously there's a tape delay happening for both the viewer and uh, the main characters, uh, including uh, Donnie Wahlberg. Um, I, I just thought it was brilliant and I loved it. And the original Psycho is like classic horror uh, that I just every time I've ever sat down and watched that. Obviously, you have the iconic shower scene, but you also have just this sadistic horror icon uh, played by Anthony Perkins uh, that is hiding in plain sight throughout the beginning of the film. And, and really, you don't uh, find out until, I don't want to say it's really, you know, like, as hard. I mean, it is when you find out uh, with him wearing the mother's outfit. Yeah. But at the same time, like, there are definite clues throughout the film after you mm-hmm. watch it a second, third time, or whatever. Um, but he plays it so well throughout that. And he's, that, that last scene is so fucked up when he's kind of reading you know, that monologue through the mother's voice. And it's just, yeah, it's so bizarre yeah, uh, and great. And Hitchcock was obviously the master of his craft. Uh, and for that time, put out just a marvelous film. Um, and no, it I mean, just I, stands test of time. I still maintain that without a psycho, we would not have, I would say, as wonderful of a catalog of horror films to choose from post psycho. Like, I think he was the first one to, Elevate it from something that was pulpy to something that was just downright creepy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's just. It's just yeah. So th- those three are, are at the top of my list. And um, I think they're all quite good. And I think it is very horror uh, that two of them are sequels. Yeah. Because that well, I mean, is. That's a big part of the genre. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even more so than, you know, that. I, I don't want to say it's ahead of its time, but. Uh, the idea of just continuous sequels on uh, things that happen to click in a genre where there's just so, or at least you know, for a long time, was just so much trash oh, yeah. that was put out there. If something catches on, they are going to ride that into the ground. And now that is popular climate. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to horror movies in general, it's kind of funny because, uh, in my opinion at least, like all the trajectories of horror movies are so shrouded in death and whatnot that... Uh, while superhero movies are very much made for sequels, mm-hmm. for example, because there's always another conflict and your heroes are going to save the day, sure. horror movies defy the odds because of the fact that it's pretty much doomed from the start, and yet they also have to continue the story because the horror movies are slightly marginalized, uh, both back then, even during the 80s when they had their heyday, but especially right now, that the only way to make a horror movie these days is to create a property that you know continues past its expiration date. And but yeah, it's just one of those things you have to accept if you're going to like horror films. Mm-hmm. And it also um, can be if it's crafted the right way, could be definitely an endearing part of that genre. Oh yeah, I mean that's how sometimes you get some of the more creative things, whether it be the ridiculous twists of Saw or. Um, the campiness of a Jason movie or whatnot. So, hmm. yeah. Uh, so my answer mm-hmm. for this completely shocking question that I had no preparation for, uh, my favorite horror movie. All right, I'm going to name five movies, but I'm not going to talk about all five or anything because I cannot whittle it down okay. on the spot. But I'll just kind of give a brief overview and say that my five are The Shining. Mm-hmm. Don't need to say anything more about that. Mm-hmm. The Vanishing, uh, mm. the Swedish film, which is kind of my answer to not or not all horror has to be like uh, shocking and or you know jump scare filled or whatnot because that's just a horrible uh, story in and of itself uh, that it will make you think about it long mm-hmm. after. Mm-hmm. Um, the original Wicker Man, mm. 
and um, two other movies, which are uh, Christmas Evil, which hmm. is a film from the 80s, which I maintain is fantastic and certainly has that wonderful Yuletide uh, horror element that may get brought up later on this uh, questionnaire. Hmm. And then my uh, my fifth will be my little plug for a foreign horror film, which is uh, Martyrs, which is a French film from 2011, I think, or something or whatever. Roughly, probably around the same time as uh, the movie we're going to talk about, because that movie was also kind of inspired by what's known as the French New Wave extremism, hmm. uh, which is a little subgenre of horror in and of itself, where um, the French, in the last 15 years or so, really started to make these extremely gruesome horror films that weren't necessarily torture porn, but they just took an idea and they went past the line of what's usually um, uh, acceptable in a movie when it comes mm. to brutality and violence and whatnot, and yet took it super seriously and not in a kind of like saw or hostile way where you're just supposed to kind of laugh at the the, the victims mm. every once in a while at least. So, uh, yeah, Martyrs is a great movie for anyone. Uh, there was a horrible English language remake that <laughs> no one should watch. Actually, there's a horrible language... English language remake of The Vanishing as well. Oh, that, yeah. That's a that's a trend right there. Mm. Oh yeah, I already named a foreign film. Well, I don't give a fuck. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so that those are my five answers okay. for favorite horror film. I put you on the spot a little bit, I guess. Okay. So there you go. Uh, so when it comes to my least favorite horror mm-hmm. film, uh, as as a theme with my answers, I had two. Um, and that is the Wicker Man remake, which is still probably one of the worst films I've ever seen in my life. Definitely the worst film I've ever seen in the theater. Hmm. And uh, last year's film, The Cloverfield Paradox. I almost thought about that. Yeah. But I just don't even know if I even find it that horror-esque, even though it is, like, of the genre. Mm-hmm. Like, um, yeah, no, I think one of those is a really good choice. I still think The Wicker Man, the remake is literally a bad movie and then becomes one of the worst movies if you really compare it to the original <laughs> and, and how that went about its business. Mm. But I did, I when when I watched it for the first time when you showed it uh, to me finally mm-hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, I found it to be weirdly charming. Um, mm. Not so much that it's so bad it's good, but it's like it's so bad that it's surreal, which is technically what it is supposed to kind of be at times. So. Yeah. There, there are scenes in there that I actually kind of like. Oh, um, it's, a, it, it's definitely amusing. Yeah, uh, but I can understand anybody's... Oh, but yeah. it is just burned into my brain yeah. as the worst movie that I... Not just horror movies, just, that's just the worst movie I've ever seen. Absolutely, so. and I think it's something that, at least for me at least, that's aged better. Like, if I had seen it back when it came out, I think I would not have taken it necessarily as seriously as now. So the other thing, too, is that Nicolas Cage has kind of defined that kind of character. Yeah, I was as time say, has gone. Like, this the, is what we want from him today. Yeah. yeah. But at the time, yeah, uh, yeah. and obviously he did silly things all the time, like yeah. Face Off, Con Air, The Rock. But he did whatever. silly things for people who kind of knew how to harness it, which oh, yeah. Neil LeBron butte or whatever his name is uh definitely didn't know what to do with it uh which is actually kind of what i enjoy about nicholas cage in that movie because i feel like he's not being directed (laughs) um but yeah Hmm. Uh, but no i definitely understand anybody just hating that uh for any reason um yeah uh my turn yeah yeah. i will say um i really couldn't come up with a great answer for least favorite horror movie because i think the one thing I realized when looking through, like, bad horror movies is that I like bad horror movies. Oh, yeah, sure. So it's kind of like one of those Catch-22. So I just thought of the most recent horror movie that pissed me off, which was Brightburn from last year, <laughs> which I just thought was really... Was it this year? Was it this year? Yeah. Oh, fuck. It's even worse. Yeah, even... so um, I, it's not one of the worst movies I've ever seen or anything like that, but just talk about wasted potential of a horror subject, you know, and we have I feel like everybody was excited to see that. Yeah, too. I, yeah, no, for sure. And that movie had maybe one or two sequences where I was like, this is the movie. This is it. This is what it could be doing for 90 minutes, like the father-son talk when they go out in the woods and whatnot, and mm-hmm. um, maybe one other scene. But other than that, that was just a waste of some decent gore effects, which I did like, mm-hmm. uh, in service of just one of the most, I don't know, incomprehensible 
plots when it comes to parenting and nature versus nurture. It was just, it was just awful. Mm. I literally never need to see that one again. <laughs> so, and that's like one of those. The other thing too, if we're being frank, mm. um, <laughs> sometimes when I think about like how bad a movie is, I also then run it through the test, at least theoretically in my mind, is that will this movie be enhanced with mind altering substances? And I think of a movie like Brightburn, and I'm like, no, that would just be boring, and it would be stupid. Whereas, like, I could think of other bad movies, like maybe the Wicker Man remake or oh, something. Oh, sure. <laughs> Where I'm like, no, that could be kind of fun, you know, whatever. And I feel like, okay, then there's some inherent value in that. Whereas something like Brightburn, uh, uh, it's just fucking stupid. and It's just sterile. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the most recent thing of that category I've seen, so that's why it popped up in my head. <laughs> so, um... I'm still formulating my exact answer, but yes. um, why don't you uh, let everybody in on what your favorite horror movie moment is? Oh, boy. Okay. So I chose two. Okay. One, because um, I chose two because I chose one moment that I would actually consider scary, and then one moment that's a moment that happened in a horror film that isn't necessarily like one of the scariest things I've ever seen, but I feel like can only happen in the context of horror. Hmm. So if we go scary, just plain things that creep me out... Um, there is a scene in the Italian horror film The Beyond by uh, director Lucio Fulci, uh, who's just amazing when it comes to practical effects. Uh, there's a scene in that movie, The Beyond, where a spider just has a field day with somebody's eyeball. And I don't, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where... It, I'm bewildered right now. Oh, yeah. So no, just, it's... Ugh. It's exactly what it sounds like, a spider mm-hmm. crawling up on somebody's body, getting up to the head, and then his little legs start going to town at the eyeball and basically carving it out of the socket and whatnot. And this is in the 80s, so of course it's practical effects, and mm. it's one of the things that it looks so fake that it circles back around to being looking realistic because it's so practical and it's so disgusting and I absolutely love it. <laughs> but the first time I watched it, I was kind of like just wigging out in my chair because I I think eyes are probably the only thing I ever have any trouble with in mm. horror movies. Like, there are some things I know that some people have trouble with for good reason, like Achilles tendons, you know, and whatnot, or uh, maybe throat slits or whatever. But mm-hmm. for me... It always comes down to an eye. Um, for example, the eye gouging in the movie Salo is the only minute in that entire, you know, almost two-hour movie that actually creeps me out or grosses me out or anything. Hmm. Uh, I can take anyone peeing or pooping on each other, but <laughs> if you just take a scalpel for one second and you uh, t- t- remove somebody's eye, that'll do it. Hmm. Uh, but the beyond that, I don't know how they got this animatronic-esque spider to just do and look at least realistic enough that I buy that it's a creature uh, on top of a dummy, clearly, you know, whatever, scooping out somebody's eye. It's just horrific, and I love it so much. Um, For my other favorite scene, I chose a scene in the original Wicker Man. (laughs) Um, There's a scene in there where um, the detective that's investigating this island and its inhabitants uh, is getting ready for bed in the, you know, inn that he's staying at and whatnot, and there is somebody in the room next door who is this kind of blonde. Uh, I think she's played by Anita Ekberg, who was a Bond girl at one point. She just looks like a blonde bombshell, busty, you know, whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, she is in the room next door, and she plays a character on the island that is sexualized from the very first frame that she even appears in because there's literally a song that the detective witnesses where, first of all, if, for those who don't know, the original Wicker Man is a musical. Hmm. Like, not like everybody stops what they're doing to, like, f- you know, burst out and tap dance, but, like, people stop what they're doing to do communal sing-alongs, you know, like, this is an island tradition, hmm. whatnot, and they do it at least eight or nine times, so it, it qualifies as an actual musical. So, like, one of the first things you're introduced to when you see her for the first time is the entire town in this pub uh, in front of the detective singing about basically how they all want to have sex with the, quote-unquote, the farmer's daughter, which is her in this context, uh, even though she's, like, 17 or something. Hmm. So later on in the movie, when she's in her room, which she seems to have been placed there uh, on purpose, uh, which is the room next over from the detective, she basically kind of confounds and uh, tempts all of his, uh, I don't know, 
uh, def defenses, so to speak, because she starts tapping on the wall next door and she starts seeing this song. And it's one of the weirdest, most bizarre and surreal, be it kind of erotically charged things I've ever seen. And it literally only works in a horror. Like if it was in a straight drama, it would be bizarre to the point where it would make no sense. Whereas here, it's just kind of like, okay, this is another way that the town is just completely screwed up and, you know, whatever. So, uh, I that scene is always something that gives me just the weirdest boner, and I feel like that's horror in a nutshell. Hmm. So yeah, The Wicker Man. Well put. So uh, in terms of my in in if I probably took some more time, I'd probably have a more uh, defined answer here. Uh, but at the same time, I'm pretty happy with my response. Um, so. I think this has to do, and it, probably my love for this particular scene definitely has to do with the fact that when I saw this, I had no idea it was coming, uh, which today, if I go back and watch this film, obviously I know everything about it, but at the same time, like I still have this almost like, I don't want to say giddy, but I'm just like, these fond memories of watching for the first time and being like, Oh, mm -hmm. uh, this is something. Uh, and that is when the, uh, when the big scene in the bar happens in from dusk till dawn. Oh yeah. Uh, and I honestly did not know anything mm. about that film. The first time I yeah, saw that it. would and, do it. Oh, absolutely. No doubt. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, it takes a turn, uh, and I mean, I'm assuming that most people, even if they've never seen it, know what the film is necessarily about, but if they don't, I don't want to spoil it, because I thought it's just the first time, I was just blown away on how large of a shift that film took, because it first, like, 45 minutes is committed to yeah. what it is, and there are no real, I mean, I guess there are little hints, but there are no like overt like in the background you're seeing what actually is going right, on like, like Shaun of the Dead or something yeah. where every time like and that's part of the satire in Shaun of the Dead but like when he goes to like get the morning paper there are zombies in the background mm -hmm. and just only he doesn't notice or something like that yeah yeah but in this film i mean you have so many bizarre things going on uh, especially Quentin Tarantino's character who's giving just as per usual an awful performance <laughs> Uh, and George Clooney, who was in the early parts of his film acting career. And again, the film takes a just enormous shift to a almost completely different genre, subgenre from yeah. where it was earlier in the film. Uh, and then the rest of the film is just that. Yeah. And uh, it, I just, every time I think about that, I just love that because, uh, especially in, in this era to go into a film and just have no knowledge of that i just look back on that fondly every time yeah no and as someone myself who when i watched it i knew very much about the subject matter of that movie particularly stuff that happens in the second half mm -hmm. but even i didn't realize that that was more of a psycho-esque structure where the first 40 or so minutes is one movie and then because when i was watching it for the first time even if i knew that that was a thing I, it got to the point where after about 35 to 40 minutes i was like oh, you know what i might be confusing this with another movie mm. and then about 10 minutes later i was like nope i am not oh because it is it it is committed to yep. that then as soon as it turns it mm -hmm. is full on yeah uh and yeah i just it just wonderful and i think the first half of the movie is actually really good yeah, no. i actually think i might prefer it yeah, them, I so, think yeah. overall, but certainly uh, I think the movie's memorable oh, sure. because of the second sure. half. Yeah. But no, yeah, that's that's what makes it great. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Are you going to say another scene or are you going to the next question? I'm actually going to go to the next question. Before you do, okay. I just want to say my honorable mention, because okay. I'm remembering it, is for best horror scene, is the introduction of Leatherface in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm. uh, which is probably my favorite horror villain introduction ever because of the fact that after quite a long time, I mean, it's at least 20, 25 minutes or so, um, even the characters get to go through most of the house without meeting anybody mm -hmm. uh, until 
the the main character is standing in front of what looks like a wall, but is actually a secret door to the meat locker or whatever. Uh, but the way Leatherface opens that door behind her, grabs her, and takes his meat, whatever, hammer, mm -hmm. and just knocks her out cold in the span of about two seconds is one of the most brutal use of uh, sound mixing and mm. and and cinematography because it's not happening in the foreground. You pretty much think she's completely okay because of the fact that it's happening in the background. And then you just realize that that's why it's happening because she's already trapped and whatnot. Mm. And I absolutely love the way that that's blocked. So, Since uh, you were just talking, I uh, thought about the other one that I was going to Please. mention, which I guess I'll use as an honorable mention. <laughs> uh, as per usual, I always have multiple things that I want to say. Um, and that is definitely more of a random type thing, but it is definitely memorable for me every time when I think about that. Uh, and that is mentioning him for the second time uh, in our little segment we're doing here. Poor Donnie Wahlberg yeah. uh, meets his demise at the hands of two large cubes of ice. Um, yep. And that is set up throughout uh, the entirety of the film. And like it's actually part of the very first scene as you see him hanging and, and you see the melting ice cube below him. But there's really like no for sure that that's going to be what, and like that film shows you exactly what that would look like. Which would be Saw 4. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and at the very end of Saw 4, uh, his head gets completely squashed like a pumpkin uh, by these two huge sheets of ice that just come together and just squish it like a ketchup packet. It's pretty great. It is a payoff uh, to, I mean, since it saw watching it, you would assume that they would go through with that at some point. Yeah, but sometimes they've shied away from things. Like, yeah. for example, the eye scalpel scene. That's yeah. one of the few times when Saw literally has, I think, its character chicken out because they didn't want to push that envelope. <laughs> um, Even the bear trap, like, they, they don't really have that until very late in the series when it actually works. Ah, yeah. It actually became, like, a running joke. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. Uh, so two more yep. uh, categories that we can uh, hit before moving on to the uh, the film. Uh, I would say we should talk about favorite horror movie tropes. All right. Um, and I have a couple of them uh, that I usually love. Um, one that I actually do really actually love is surprise endings. Mm. I think that is such a, like it's a thing that is a staple in a lot of horror films, even if it's not a like quote unquote surprise, yeah. there's still always, not always, but a lot of horror films have some sort of major twist, or at least what the film thinks is a major twist uh, towards the end. It's baked into the, I think, central ideology of horror, which is you have to up the stakes. Mm. So whether you're upping it in uh, tension or you're upping it in uh, violence or whatever, same goes for narrative. And by the end of it, if you are not in some way shocked by what you've seen, uh, that is uh, an aberration in horror, not necessarily a, a commonplace. Yeah. And I just legitimately do love it because I love twists slash surprise endings in any film whether it be really easy Disney fare or whether it be a gruesome horror film, uh, a good surprise ending is something that I'm always up for and interested in. And in the horror movie, it works and uh, happens quite frequently. And I'm a fan. So the other one I would definitely mention that I uh, always fall for um, and you see quite often is unreliable vehicles because <laughs> the idea of... There's always a car that doesn't work or a car that won't start or a car. I mean, there's a lot of things like cell phones or whatever. But whenever there's a there's there's always a car that like somebody's trying to get to. And I think it must harken back to older days of horror when people would try to run away and like the obvious person watch and be like, why wouldn't they just try to get a car? And then the alternative to that is well we'll show them getting into a car but the car just doesn't work like the battery won't start or something like that it just it's just so silly and stupid but at the same time i feel like it's prevalent in so many of the horror films that i remember uh and i just um do actually appreciate that yeah uh i mean i have kind of two tropes my number one trope for sure uh is this should not be a surprise but is christmas time mm. or uh mm -hmm. While I wouldn't say my favorite 
horror films are Christmas horror films, I will say that I can watch any Christmas horror film and probably give it minimal two stars. Like, I mean, there's the one with Bill Goldberg that you... Yes, yeah. and it's great. Santa's sleigh. Love it. Uh, with a great cameo in the beginning by James Caan, who calls Chris Kattan, and I apologize for the language here, folks, but he calls him half of a faggot. And I still don't exactly know what that insult uh, entails in in his psyche, but whatever. Uh, he does get killed off, thankfully, because he should, because that's harsh and just very mean. Um, but God, Santa Slay, that's great. Uh, <sighs> there's so many great ones. I, literally, I have... Okay, if you go into my room, which I encourage you to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have all my movies everywhere, but then I have two boxes, and one is this kind of, like, see-through Tupperware box, which is Christmas movies. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not talking about my porn boxes. <laughs> that's my Chipotle box. <laughs> which I stole from a work outing <laughs> because we had it catered. And I was like, this box is huge, and it also has a lid. This is amazing. Um, anyway, uh, but I have this one Tupperware kind of silver or see-through, whatever, that is um, Christmas movies, you know, just anything you can think of, Christmas vacation, even movies I don't even like, but because I love Christmas movies in general, I buy them because I have to have it, whether it's Christmas vacation or a Muppet Christmas Carol, which I love, of Christmas course. Christmas with the cranks. Don't have that. Oh. I know. I, I do have some standards. <laughs> but there are some classics that I don't really love. But, like, if I don't have access to it, that would be weird. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be that guy that's like, oh, we can't watch A Christmas Story because that's not one of my favorite Christmas movies or something mm. like that. Yeah. Um, but next to it, I have a shoebox. And in the shoebox is exclusively Christmas horror. And it has things like Silent Night, Deadly Night, uh, All Through the House, uh, Silent Night, Bloody Night, just Silent Night. There's a lot of Silent Night riffs. Uh, <laughs> Black Christmas, both the remake, the original, Christmas Evil. There's a lot in this subgenre, and I absolutely love it. There's just something to me about blood being sprayed and splayed across the twinkle of Christmas lights mm. that is just mm, chef's kiss. It's just... Just right on my own, and I absolutely love it. Um, the other thing I will say is uh, for tropes uh, is haunted mansions. Like mm. I don't even really care if it's haunted that much or if they're just stuck. You just love Eddie Murphy. I do. Oh, my God, I do. First of all, he was great. He's back. He is, and he was great in uh, Dolomite is my name because I watched that on Netflix. I've heard so many people say that that's legitimately really good. It is. Yeah. I mean, I was primed to like it because – I like Dolomite mm-hmm. and Rudy Ray Moore, but I also was kind of surprised that it was actually really good. Um, that, in my opinion, Dolomite is my name, uh, is what the disaster artist should have been. Mm. It should have been way more. I mean, I don't really actually. I, sh- I actually I kind of take that back because I don't really give a shit about Tommy Wiseau. Um, whereas <laughs> I kind of think I have respect for Rudy Ray Moore, um, but just as far as how a movie works and whatnot. Mm. But yeah. I, Simple plug, everybody should watch Dolomite is my name. My parents, who have never watched a single Rudy Ray Moore film, and probably never will, <laughs> um, enjoyed the movie. So okay. that says a lot, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, Haunted Mansions in general, like if a team of people are in some way either trapped or spending the night against all common sense in a place that that's pretty much like... That's another one of those where I have a high threshold for tolerance, where it's like, it could be bad, but I take comfort knowing that there's, they're still going to have to sleep there that night. <laughs> um, and whether it's some weird oddballs of a genre, like uh, this one random movie called The Legend of Hell House, or, yeah, The Legend of Hell House, uh, starring Roddy uh, McDowell. Um, but that was great, and a few other ones, whatever. But that trope, I pretty much will never get tired of. So, yeah, Christmas time though, that's that's my jam. That's your jam. Yeah, it's right up your alley. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. So the last one I had was, uh, I think, a very important one, uh, especially for me in the horror genre, which is favorite horror icon. Um, and this is such an important part of so many horror franchises, especially. But even the non-horror franchises usually have a character. I mean, I'm I'm thinking of even like um, uh, Sean Beam's character in that uh, really just not great movie where he's 
like a uh, trucker and I think Luke Wilson is in it. Maybe not. I'm thinking of a different movie. I'm, I'm really mixing these up, but Sean Beam is in this horror movie where he's, I think he's a hitchhiker and he uh, ends up catching on to these people and plays this really just rugged uh, horror villain. And I feel like even that could be considered in this uh, yeah. category of being an icon in a way. Uh, but my two, uh, the one of them is more, uh, I would say, of a, I have to include this character because I just always gravitate toward this because I think this character's parts are the best parts of the films and they really have no bearing on the actual story, but I uh, really enjoy it when Billy the Puppet comes on yeah. screen in any of the Saw films. So I should say that my favorite horror icon is Jigsaw. Okay. Just to bridge this conversation. Okay. But continue. Uh, and uh, Billy the Puppet is a character who comes and goes, and he's more of a mascot. Uh, but I would say, I, I think there might be entire films where he is not present at all uh, in the Saw series. But I think as the series went on, they were much more aware that fans like me were like all in for doing something silly with that puppet. Um, and I mean, even in the trailer for that last film that came out, I uh, think Jigsaw. he's present in every movie. Okay, that he, just he may be, but that just sounds weird to me that he wouldn't be. I feel like early on in the series, because like in the first film, I think it was really there just to be. So creepy and weird yeah. but I, feel... I know he's in the second because the SWAT yeah. team comes against him mm-hmm. which means if the third one is the only one he's not in that would be weird but I, is, anyway, as the series yeah. wore on he becomes oh, much yeah. more of a like how's he riding that bike yes and in the trailer for Jigsaw he makes a prominent appearance in the end of the trailer and it is fantastic and I mean even though it is a horrendous scene, uh, him showing up at the end of the opening scene in Saw 7 is like a, there he is! He did it! Mm-hmm. Woo! And he just comes, he's on his bicycle, right? Or a tricycle or whatever he comes oh, yeah. riding. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, ridiculous. It really is. Yes. Uh, and then my favorite actual horror icon yes. is Jason Voorhees. Mm. Uh, every, just this idea of him. Not his mom. <laughs> Uh, him showing up and never having really any speaking parts and just being this grisly, demented, ruthless murderer that is just on a rampage in every single film is um, pretty fantastic. Uh, especially because, I mean, you talk about like Leatherface, that's a, another example of that. But so many, and they're good. Like, a lot of them are good, like Freddy Krueger. Um, but there's this idea of this voiceless, soulless being that is just strolling around and just, and especially in the later Jason films that are definitely comedic, uh, that character, like, I feel like it's actually a challenge to write that character and have him be not funny but at the same time not be like jason goes to hell he's gonna fuck you up kind of thing so yeah i I don't know i'm just always such a fan and the longer that series went on the more enjoyable that character was for me no i agree with you on that especially because i think um at the first few entries he's not a good character because Mm -hmm. he's just a derivative of michael myers like mm-hmm. what you know on the surface they're not that much different as far as being voiceless oh, yeah. you know whatever mm-hmm. but once it realized that michael myers never got off the road and became kind of more than it is whatever then i think they started writing jason into more comedic situations that never really betrayed the character but just kind of amped up almost became a parody of michael myers in general and i I absolutely love it in those later entries for sure as i do too i mean just looking at the silliness in jason takes manhattan and um the one where he comes back from the dead uh Uh, jason lives jason Uh, Jason lives number six uh jason x obviously and and obviously a wonderful entry freddy versus jason (laughs) It just is so ridiculous. But again, he never really, be, like, he never really, like, he's not like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Terminator movies where he starts wearing pink sunglasses. 
like he is just this same character yet the events surrounding him are changing uh, and, it, and it's although he does have that ridiculous moment where he looks at the hockey billboard uh, in Jason Takes Manhattan that is and he looks at the camera then and that is just <laughs> one of the dumbest things I've great heard, yeah it is pretty good uh, so he is definitely my, my favorite icon yeah no I mean as I said mine is Jigsaw I think it's mostly nostalgia because that is the franchise that I was able to grow up with uh, in real time obviously as a kid I could have watched uh, Jason Freddy whatever but those were the movies that were coming out to the theaters, and those were and and Jigsaw, uh, as played by Tobin Bell, is I think a formidable villain in a way that we hadn't seen before. It's kind of like almost a bureaucratic villain where he sits behind a desk most times mm-hmm. and just lets these things that he's created happen instead of uh, you know holding over a knife uh, over somebody's whatever. And the the threat of that it's you're your own undoing due to your mistakes or whatever. Uh, is completely bullshit as a <laughs> as a credible defense, even though sometimes the Saw movies likes to wank it as like, oh, he's not really a murderer. It's like, whoa, you guys are in law enforcement. <laughs> this is scary. Um, <laughs> but in general, it totally works as a as a piece of horror. Uh, and Tobin Bell, I will say, doesn't really. Uh, phone it in. I'm not saying like he does like hard work or something toward the end, but when he shows up, uh, the character is simple enough and usually old and frail enough that he can show up, he does his voice, and he gets out, and uh, it just never became embarrassing on his end. I will say that. Like, at the worst, uh, he was never ever the problem of, with any song no, movie. No, uh, I, I do think, uh, and even though it is for me definitively the best entry after the original trilogy i think in saw six he was like i think i'm done now yeah like because in that film he's like doing this ridiculous argument with somebody about health insurance and having this really bizarre um thing where he goes to a book signing and like has a has a really weird cryptic conversation with an author. And it's like, although maybe that's in Saw 7. It, it doesn't really matter. No, I think that part's in Saw 6. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there are moments that happen later that are really winky. Uh, and at the same time, I feel like Tobin Bell was probably more just annoyed that this was part of what he had to do to get his paycheck. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think he ever let it affect him no. when he was trying, at least, or whatever. So, I mean, in in reality, and even though he is definitely a major part of it, and to their credit, like, he is a minor character after the trilogy ends. And even in the trilogy. Like, as much... Well, not in the trilogy in and of itself, but... The third film, he's a pretty main character. That's funny, too, because that's my favorite. Uh, <laughs> so maybe that's also indicative of that. Yeah. But I would say, even that, though, he's, his presence is still, as we know, like, bedridden man mm-hmm. monologue. So I guess I like the idea of a horror villain who's just psychologically, you know, screwing with everybody mm. instead of... Uh, going around running around and whatnot like so but yeah right on good stuff boom absolutely so uh the film uh as mentioned previously that we're going to uh dig a little deeper in is the 2009 film uh out of australia called the loved ones uh, in this film stars uh, Xavier Samuel as Brent. Uh, we previously talked about uh, a film that he was in from 2016 called Love and Friendship, uh, which myself and Nick saw at Sundance uh, and very much enjoyed. Uh, that is by one of Nick's favorite filmmakers, Whit Stillman. That's right. Uh, and he's been in other things, too. Uh, he was uh, a small character in the movie I Really Like, Fury, uh, with Brad Pitt. Was he? Uh, he was Do also... Do you remember what he was in that? I, just I, I don't. Okay. I think he was just one of the random yeah, soldier, soldier characters yeah. that shows up at one point. Uh, and also, the other credit that uh, caught my eye when I was looking up him as a uh, actor... Uh, is he was one of the two boys uh, in the, uh, by all accounts, horrible movie uh, with Naomi Watts and Robin Wright called Adore, uh, which I... Oh, he was. Yeah. I've seen that movie. Have you seen it? Yes. I've always wanted to watch it. I didn't realize he was one of the two guys. Yeah. Uh, Because I watched it before, and that's an Australian movie, so that makes... Because Ben Mendelsohn is in it. 
Uh, oh, wow. I mean, it makes sense. He's kind of a hot piece of cake. Mm-hmm. That's what people say, right? I don't think so, but I'll go with it. <laughs> I, I, anyways, people I, eat their cake hot, right? <laughs> I've uh, I've always been intrigued by that, and I've heard it's just terrible, and I think that's one of the you reasons You know what's why. actually weird about it is that it's not as bad as it looks, okay. and that was actually kind of upsetting. That oh, it, was, okay. it was slightly competent as melodrama. Mm. Like, you know what the premise is, so you have to laugh at that. But so I'm assuming it's, it's definitely not... I mean, Ben Mendelsohn is in it, so it's like, was I okay. really going to hate it? No. See, because, and I guess my, maybe I'm thinking of water, but when I think of that, I think of it being as ridiculous and stupid as a movie like this year's Serenity. No, it, it is. No, oh, see, no. that's, that's disappointing. It is. Yeah. Um, like it, it, it pained me the fact that I was able to get through it pretty easily. Oh, okay. so to speak. Which yeah. is not to say that it's good, but no, that is kind of disappointing. Actually. But yeah, no, absolutely. Yep. Uh, so the other main performer here is Robin McLeavy, yep. uh, who plays uh, one of the kidnappers. Uh, who just wanted to go to prom with Xavier Samuel's character of Brent. Yeah. Uh, although, um, it seems like sh- she's not really giving him the whole story when she asks him to prom. It's a pattern. Mm, it would appear that way. <laughs> uh, so, the story surrounding the loved ones uh, is when Brent turns down his crest classmates <laughs> his <laughs> classmate lola's invitation to prom she concocts a wildly violent plan for revenge yeah so actually if you don't mind i think yes. i will go first actually oh please uh, surprisingly because i um what Am i actually I not pretty enough mm, i like what you did there i actually did quite enjoy uh this film Yay. and i um I am glad that Nick told me uh, to not really look up anything about this. He had already given the premise, um, but to not look up anything from the trailer because that does reveal quite a bit. Uh, So I followed his suggestion and did not look at anything regarding this film. Uh, And I was definitely pleasantly surprised with the outcome. And another thing uh, is that I feel like this film not only takes from a lot of other films, uh, but also has given two films yeah. that have come since. Uh, I had many thoughts of the film Prisoners mm. uh, from 2013 that came out four years after this film, which is very bizarre that that kind of especially like connect the dots of like Hugh Jackman being Australian being like, you know, be great, mate. Yeah. <laughs> if we just have somebody buried down there who can't talk. This last Christmas I was uh, down in the under and saw this movie by Mr. Sean Byrne. <laughs> yeah. And then they're like, you know, we can just knock that off. No one in America has seen this. <laughs> no one knows what's happening. That's it's right. fine. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, so I think the opening scene of this uh, is actually – quite good uh and then that just follows through with the rest of the film uh i will say there are plenty of twists and turns here which is uh, as mentioned earlier is a hallmark i think of a really solid horror film they're but twists and turns but they're in the moment mm-hmm. like on paper it's not like what if you know the premise anything bends beyond the premise so to speak but Great. that's kind of why I was like, yeah, don't watch the trailer because you'll kind of see where this will zig and zag, so to speak. So, And I uh, still have not watched the trailer for it, but I could definitely see where you're coming from with that. I I think the opening scene of this film where we see the car crash uh, that leads to our main character, Brent's uh, father's death, uh, is obviously important because it does have a lot of... A, a lot of information about what will happen in future. Uh, the person that he tries to avoid running over that comes back later in multiple parts of the storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, that is not the aha moment where I feel like a lot of horror films or just movies in general could fall into the trap of having an explanation of what happened in that wacky opening scene. And that is the reveal at the end where this is kind of a reveal halfway through, um, and it would you know, make it a lot easier for characters then and you as the viewer to understand what the characters are going through. But at the same time, 
it is more just context for the story mm-hmm. of what is happening. And then we see the events actually play out after that. And now we have all of the information that happens with these characters, at least in the early events of the film that we saw play out. I just thought that this film was so uncomfortable to watch and I usually do not get as visceral I feel like when watching movies that is more reserved for one Tucson Egan yeah but watching this film I was physically distraught by certain aspects of this film and I think it's really to this because I feel like uh, and I did mention this, and I actually do think, even though I had no idea what I was talking about, uh, I do think that there is comparisons to some S. Craig Zoller uh, type of horror in this. Yeah. Because watching this, like, I had, like, the visceral reaction that I did in something like Bone Tomahawk, where I was like, oh, good lord. I thought if I had said that before you watched it, it would have set up a different expectation as to okay. what it was. It could be. Yeah. But I, I guess as someone who is now, where we both have seen mm-hmm. it, I would definitely agree and kind okay. of contextualize that for yeah. sure. And just seeing how the actual actions of the family that kidnaps Brent, uh, and really it is just the daughter who is pulling all the strings here, Uh, and making this happen uh, with her father that is under some sort of whack job Mandy spell. It is kind (laughs) of uncomfortable at times when you, I wouldn't say at all, sympathize with the father, but there are moments in which you see the cracks crumble a little bit and you see that he is just as much of a prisoner in, uh, maybe just as much as stretching it. But, uh, for example, the dancing scene when she closes her eyes for a kiss, he just literally has this almost sigh of exasperation of, like, he's let this go too far, well, I, and he I, can't really say no. I was going to say, uh, you had mentioned when we were watching that that she is kind of the leader of the house and definitely in control, although I feel like he is definitely the master and she being the apprentice, and yet she is now overtaken uh, yeah. that because... We see moments throughout this film play out where he is almost teaching her how to do certain things, and yet at the same time, she is clearly in control of all of the actions that are happening throughout uh, this film, uh, and it has very uncomfortable uh, effects on both the characters and on me as the audience member in this specific example, because there are just scenes of this film that are just and and this is coming from someone who watched um the house that jack built last Mm. year and was just like that's fucked up Mm. and watching this i I just am i'm not okay with a lot of things that are happening here how about that knife foot the knife foot was just i think the thing about it that was just so And this is another credit to foreign filmmakers. And I don't want to say that they are the end-all, be-all of making a good film. But they just have a different viewpoint. That's the thing. is, You watch movies constantly that are oversaturated by one nation's kind of collective agreement. So it's not so much that they're better, but certainly when you watch something outside of our comfort zone, it is so refreshing. And uh, the, the foot part definitely was... Because there are no the hints of like his foot being next to a spike at some point or something like that. Like it just goes straight for yeah. him hammering a knife into his foot. Yeah. Uh, a perfect example of what I'm talking about on the American side was just last night in a film that I think is quite good. A Quiet yeah. Place where Emily Blunt's character gets her dress caught on this random spiky nail coming out of the stairs and even Emily, uh, not that she would notice this, but like at once was like, oh, she's going to step on that later. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. Because that's what, that's all we got. It's right. just, yeah. look at this, dubby. Yep. <laughs> You're going to have to remember this. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just different. I mean, we talked about it on the Vanishing episode uh, where you see the perpetrator in the background, but he never is focused on. He's just yeah. in the background and you'd have to go back and watch to see him there. 
later on. So, yeah. Or even the ending of that movie, which I won't completely spoil because we're not talking about that movie, mm-hmm. but the villain of that piece explains pretty much concretely what's going to happen. And as American, I think we're conditioned to think that he's got something up his sleeve and there's more to it than that. But then we find out that, no, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. And, yeah, that's actually way more terrifying than, like, what we had thought. Uh, yeah. Like a simple murder or something yeah. like that. So. So, yes, I think that there are uh, so many horrible things happening here, which uh, I will say uh, it's not a critique of this film necessarily, but I do think something that gets a little lost in translation with this is that sometimes the visceral visceral actions that are happening uh, with the perpetrator and the family, I think, take away from the story at hand here. And I guess that is obviously intentional. But at the same time, um, I feel like if it just was a little more, I, I don't know what the best word is, but if it was just a little, a little more focused on what is happening with Brent and what he's going through, and it definitely is throughout yeah. the film, especially later towards the climax. Uh, but I feel like if it just teetered a little bit back towards that and not quite as much about like her forcing him to have to pee into the milk cup and yeah i mean that's what i'm saying those scenes and and this is a minor critique no but i feel like the payoff then towards the end would have been even better uh if it had just tilted a little more that way and i guess that's an american's viewpoint so no no but i actually think what you're saying makes perfect sense but i also think that it may be indicative of what the movie gets right which is that Mm. i think you like myself uh take the character of brent seriously as a human being and his uh past and his problems that there is a moment in which the I think the visceral torture porn aspect of the movie sometimes overshadows what could be uh, what I still consider to be an affecting human drama, but could could have even honed in more on that, which mm. I think means that they built it up well enough for you to notice it. Because a lot of times in these kind of movies, like we had talked about, like Saw or uh, Hostel or whatever, the victim you don't ever give a shit about no. Like, it's just you want to see them. And while you do kind of want to see it because you want to see something, you know, fucked up happen in these situations, you are also feeling bad for him, and you are waiting <laughs> for, uh, in this case, Lola to get their comeuppance, if possible, for sure. Which uh, I will say that is why I ended up just absolutely loving this film because I felt like, and I said this when you're watching, that there was only really one possible outcome. Here. When you said that, I got super worried because I had no idea what you were going to say. Okay. And then you actually said the outcome, and I was like, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, I think, great because the, you know, the most. I don't say the most obvious answer is the best one. Oh, and that's not true. Occam's razor. The simplest answer is the right one. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, uh, it thematically obviously oh, made total sense. Someone should make a horror movie called Occam's Razor about a guy named Occam who just goes around with a razor. And it's like he's the most obvious murder suspect ever. And that's why people don't. Yeah. yeah. Um, Get the notepad. a piece of paper and a pen this guy i'm getting i'd type it <laughs> um but I, I thought the last i don't know 20 or so minutes of this film were just absolutely fantastic um you talk about the uh antagonists getting their comeuppance big time in this film um and i did really legitimately think that there was like a pretty good chance that that just wasn't gonna happen and it was going to be like you know not that she was gonna be just falling around the road just tossing a chainsaw back and forth everywhere uh like leatherface was but i did think there was a good possibility that we were just going to end this film with her just continuing on because that just was what yeah. obviously happens she'd been doing it for a while clearly <laughs> as we see in their little basement area where they have uh, their victims down there still and Boy, was that fucked up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was... I I didn't even, like... Think about that? No. Neither did I the first time I watched it. And I love that it's actually in plain sight because she says about 
the one who's the brother of the uh, kind of goth uh, chick that the mm-hmm. stoner takes to the prom. But she says that, oh, he's the one that got away. And it's funny how that line makes it sound like, oh, she murdered all of them, even yeah. though she doesn't seem murderous. Like, and I know that's a weird thing to say, but just as far as her M.O. of everything we see. Oh, it's way worse. But yeah. and then Way, it, way worse. It is. And it yeah. makes so much more sense when you realize what's underneath their literal uh, living room. Yeah. When you realize, oh, he's the one that got away because the other one, they're still there after all this time and have devolved into just uh, primal beings. Yeah, and also, too, clearly they had had some sort of, like, extremely hot boiling water uh, dumped on their brain, which is, god damn it, just, there are so many little details of this film that just made me cringe. It's more, I think that's what this film does so well, is that more than, like, a Saw film where, like, you see things that are happening to regular people, but it feels so cinematic like it feels so unreal and contrived and created this feels so authentic and so possible and dirty and like oh god i hope someone doesn't do this to me because (laughs) this would be way worse than someone putting a bullet in my head yeah yeah so it's it's uh it's fucked up but has a very very strong ending and at the same time, too, um, I think is a a very in- bro. This, this film fucking dictates on animals. They kill animals yeah. in this movie. Damn yeah, it! Yeah, that's it. But at least the animal has a very, very good boy scene uh, where he crawls home. Yeah, uh, which is very sad, but yeah, good on him. Yeah. So. Nick, yeah, I, I've kind of just no blabbed on here, but no. go right ahead. I uh, I love this movie. Mm-hmm. I've uh, this is actually my second time, maybe third. I think I watched it one time when I was drunk, <laughs> um, but it's my second time really paying attention and watching it from start to finish. And I pretty much knew I loved this movie the, from the first time I watched it because I wasn't expecting it. But I'm happy to say that watching it, knowing everything, and just watching it to experience it and see it, I guess, cinematically, whatever, uh, it totally holds up, and I I absolutely love it. I think what's astounding about this movie is that, well, what we kind of touched on earlier is that the torture porn aspects of it, it, I wouldn't call the movie torture porn. I would say that it certainly has moments that are like uh, movies that we can think of in that kind of genre. Mm -hmm. But this is so much more than that without being much more complex than that. And that's what I love about it is that this character's journey of Brent uh, is super simple. You know, it is just a guy stuck in grief mode who has to get out of it uh, in order to keep on living. And then that's what happens, literally. And I love that it's not much more than that, but I think it makes it all the more affecting for that. I mean, what's great is that even though it's a simple uh, through line from that kind of one-to-one ratio of a metaphor, there's still some little coded things throughout his torture that become these defining moments, uh, either visually or or else. And so I'll, I'll kind of explain what I think, at least. Uh, for example... There's a moment in which after he uh, kicks Lola uh, onto the kitchen table uh, and escapes the house for the first time, and when he's the um, when he is running away, the dad is in the car and chasing him down, and a car hits the tree. Yeah. And for him to literally have to outrun a car crash, you know, what I mean, in the in in the midst of all this, is is so visually on point, uh, as obviously as to what he's dealing with, based on what we know from the prologue, uh, which is that he crashed the car into a tree that ended up uh, tragically killing his own father. Um, so, you know, even moments like that, which I think some people would see a scene like that and think, okay, this movie's just spinning its wheels, like it's having him escape, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But it's like, oh, just having him escape so that way we can buy some time. But I, I feel like everything in this moment or in this movie is 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 never a wasted moment. And there's always something, whether it's uh, just viscerally or visually happening. Um, but also another great scene is when Lola is talking to him. And when I think it's her father is doing the oh boy, I can't actually remember because they do a lot of shit to him. But if he's either 
knifing his feet down or something like that, but she's like straddling him creepily. Yeah. And then she wants him to cry. And it's funny because she doesn't actually know who she's dealing with, which is a person who is so dead inside in this moment, uh, and I guess in the last six months, because that's all he's been doing is cutting himself. So it's almost like his grief has been giving him strength, not that he should ever uh, need that to get through something like that, but uh, it becomes this kind of weird, bizarro solution to his problems in the moment, which is that he is the worst person to try to put through this because he's no one is going to beat himself up more than himself right. after what has happened, uh, you know, with his father. And and I absolutely love that. That's what comes to a head at, at a certain point in this movie where she's just so you know uh, outraged that he's not reacting like a you know victim and whatnot and. And once he sees that, then he realizes that, you know what, there's a lot of horrible shit in the world, and most of it is actually not of my doing. And so I think, at least after the events of this film, that's what's ultimately going to get him through. And I would never advocate for the idea that grief can only be explored through, like, pure hell, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But as a horror film, I think it absolutely works, and it's it's extremely affecting. Um but yeah, overall, I just think this is just, I think it's a funny movie. I think some of the lines and or moments, uh, God, the moment with the party blowers just mm. cracks me up every time when they wish she, after she's crowned <laughs> by her dad, oh boy, uh, as the prom queen or whatever, and they they each blow their party favor and then <laughs> Ken uh, is not, or Brent is not blowing his, and yeah, he's then, forced to. Pretty yeah, much. I love the way she's like, "Blow your whistle, Brent," and he's like, "Blow your whistle, Brent," and then he finally does it. Yeah, it's just like a little pathetic, little. Just, oh man, yeah. I send that gif to uh, the aforementioned Sarah from Minnesota of just him blowing the pathetic whistle every time we joke about like something just being like unceremonious. It, it's just so great. Um, but yeah, no, I, there's moments like that where I think this movie somehow is both incredibly earnest, like I love the journey that the character goes on and I feel for him and whatnot, and yet I also laugh at some of the just sheer ridiculousness, whether it's the uh, weird incestuous relationship between the daughter and I was going to bring that up when yeah, we were I'm done, done with, with my opening thoughts, Oh, I was so. going to bring that up. That is such a, um, it's such a weird moment. Mostly because the first time it's really apparent is when he gives her the dress uh, for her prom night or whatever to wear. Um, And he, like, clearly is going to just walk out and she gives him, like, no, you can stay. Yeah. As she's changing. He's got to see how it looks. I know. And he's just like, okay. So here's the thing, though. (laughs) I fully, and I think it's completely up in the air. So, like, this is not like the Joker, Hmm. where where if you have a different interpretation, I'm going to be like, what? Um, I like how you just did that in Brent's voice, too. That's good. (laughs) Um, But I personally actually think the dad is, like, scared shitless the entire time like i do think he relishes some of the violence like when it comes to protecting his little girl for Mm. sure but like in those moments i actually think at least for me at least some of the comedy comes from the idea and i just think that's actually one of the great things about this movie is the performances across the board but the guy who plays the dad is so good because i don't think he ever truly commits to one thing so that i think it becomes this weird living fluid character but when he is about to leave the bedroom and she's like, oh, no, you got to see how it looks. Like, his kind of like, oh, man, like, I have turned, it, you know, Daddy's Little Princess into Daddy's Little Princess a little too literally. Mm. Uh, and this is maybe my own doing because I cannot, like, say no. Like, I don't know. I took it as this weird. Yet he is definitely a willing participant. In all He's a willing this. participant in her I would say in her violent escapades when it comes to protecting her. Like, he wants her happy, mm. like, just like a father would. But I think this truly, the character, is like a bastardization of the creepy dads who want to do the daddy-daughter dances and, and the pledge to daddy, mm. which is like, oh, I would never have sex with my daughter. I just, you know, 
I want the best for her, and the best is me. Like <laughs> that weird contradiction where you know, like a mm-hmm. a male person thinks that their female daughter is somehow theirs and theirs only to like protect and you know coddle and whatnot. Yeah, no, and that and that's what I think this is basically kind of poking fun at like this disgusting because I genuinely think that there are times when he like just looks very like annoyed that this has come to this and yet well I I like the idea too when she goes to start kissing him on the lips like he's like so he opens up his eyes twice yeah like oh is this really so happening no and like I I feel like he like this is what's too far oh yeah no for sure and that's the thing (laughs) is that they have people that they've and he's a creepy rude. motherfucker. Well, yeah. Yeah, no, and I'm not trying to say, like, oh, he's normal, <laughs> and the daughter has warped him or anything like that. Because, um, first of all, if she's the daughter, not to get into a nature versus nurture thing, but that's like a snake eating his own tail mm. thing. Like, he created her, and she is, you know, destroying him. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a circle. But, um, I don't know, there's just so many scenes where, like, and I think one of the telling moments, too, to kind of support that is when he gets outraged that she is going to touch his little Peter uh, to to do the pee-pee um, because <laughs> I don't know why I said that in a four-year-old vernacular, but whatever. Um, but that is the only time in which he actually appears to be mad at her, mm. and but he doesn't say anything because he's, of course, scared shitless. So I think that's truly the whole shotgun dad, you know, waiting on the porch mentality, taken to an extremely gross and patriarchally uh, disgusting extreme. Yeah, but, I can see that. Yeah, uh, but yeah. other than that, though, um, what did you think about the subplot in this movie? Um, so I was I was intrigued by it. I uh, definitely was not as interested yeah. as in the main story. Do you think it should have been excised? I guess that's um, my big question. I don't necessarily think so because, along with your assessment of it, I do think it is a nice um, escape from the deep torture that is going on uh, to just kind of askew into this. Uh, Really, it's kind of funny, too, because it is definitely comic relief, but at the same time, it is somebody who is just grieving, especially and early on, like, it's not apparent that that's what's happening. It's just apparent that she's, she's, it seems, at least to me, uh, the first time through, that she's someone who just really just wanted to, like, get smoked up and drink, and that's why she was going... about her life for a night. That's why she was going out with... uh, this guy who looks like Hirschfeld <laughs> from Days and Diffuse. Yeah. So, uh, but as uh, time goes on, and I honestly would not have gotten this until the very end, where she is actually the sister of uh, one of the um, the victim, young men specifically was... the victim we see in the yeah. prologue. But yes, yeah. So uh, that whole storyline, I definitely think had a purpose here, but I definitely was less interested in that. Uh, than I was in the main storyline because I felt like I just didn't. It was like a car crash <laughs> where I couldn't look away because it was terrible and annoying, and it did make me angry as a viewer. And it was like, like it wasn't necessarily like in the same vein at all of like the guy in the theater who's like, "Yeah, string that bitch up" mm. or anything like that. But at the same time, I was like boy, she's got to get hers, right? I, I mean, mean, yeah. No, as far <laughs> as just catharsis yeah. and relief, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we see that. I mean, I think this is one of my uh, favorite final climactic scenes uh, in, in actually quite a while, mostly because you talk about catharsis. How about the idea of him driving a car um, and – First of all, the way that scene is set up is brilliant because it doesn't really show you which way he's going to be coming from. And then it, at the very end, becomes apparent that he's driving right towards it. And for a like, split second, I thought there was a real possibility he was actually going to run over his girlfriend, uh, which obviously would have been fucking horrible. Yeah, I know. I loved not only that, but the visual echo of avoiding the girlfriend. Oh, yeah. Which 
is technically his problem in a nutshell in the beginning of the movie, which is that he's running, not running away, but he's not going straight on to the relationship that may uh, kind of redeem him and, and help him through these mm-hmm. coping because he doesn't say I love you to his girlfriend, even though it's clear that he kind of does and has affection for her because he's able to write it down in the card yeah. that he's not able to give to her. But for that to visually echo the accident, uh, yeah. I just think it's But then he brilliant. ends up running over uh, Lola. Uh, and then just, uh, I-, I was like, I was pretty passionate that he <laughs> needed to double tap that shit. Uh, and uh, there I'm with you, but it, I'm also glad that they didn't do a like. Right away. Well, like a heel turn, like she's still alive and she like needs to be taken like it's still a choice at the end because they could have very easily just drove off and called the cops so it, it's less about a like backed into a corner and more about an actual honest to god i need to put this down and i think in that case it's two things emotionally and physically the person <laughs> before i can drive off yeah um that is 100 percent accurate for me though uh watching that and again we 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 talked a little earlier about horror movie tropes i just could easily see her climbing back in the car and trying to stab these two people to death uh so i'm just like you're gonna need to drive her over again because she is not dead but this film is patient and it gives a beat to let the two characters in the car have a moment um and then we do see lola's character almost exactly echoing uh, the look of the injured dog trying to walk up to the house. Um, And then just the look on her face as she sees the car starting to back up. Um, And the film does just a great job with that shot as it sort of completely pans in towards her face. And it's not like trying to create a real close-up. Like it is just moving closer to where Mm -hmm. she is. And then we have a quick cutaway to her head getting bashed in by the without by being the car. weird, like without being gratuitous. Because no. I actually think it would have been kind of gross in a bad way if the bloodless of it was kind of no it salivated. W- all it does it is just confirmation yes. that in fact she did get run over, yes. <laughs> which I thought was actually pretty nifty in the way that it, that was edited. I would agree. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought that whole scene was brilliant. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was one of the best parts of the film. Um, because it gave you exactly what you wanted. It was a perfect parallel to the original scene. I mean, talk about catharsis. I mean, that scene is just yeah. in a nutshell. And the fact that he's just driving a police car for it. I mean, we <laughs> see the awesome, uh, fantastic ending of Get Out uh, when you have the reveal of the police officer friend showing up. Uh, Excuse me, he's T.S. motherfucking ass. Well, okay, but uh, we, <laughs> yeah. we see him arriving, and of course the white yeah, cult yeah. member thought oh the police are here yay yeah. and then, oh no it's a black oh, guy no it's tsa <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But, um, uh, yeah and this has a, a very similar effect of, of having this idea of just the the protect and serve police is here although it is sad because uh the father-in-law yeah who, that's a... who who not father-in-law the the father um of the ends up in the uh, in the hole which is kind of weird because he ends up where his son escaped from, which is a weird turnaround. Also, too, that Although fa- it's kind of technically a nice little visual motif of yeah. the father kind of becoming, uh, or I should say, passing on trauma to a child. Yeah, and I, I would I would concur with that. Uh, I did think the actor who played that father looked a little too like David Lynch for me. Oh, I gotta see that. Actually. I, I don't know why. Like when he first shut up, I'm like, Dave, <laughs> what are you doing here? Hello, Detective Gordon. <laughs> oh man, yeah, actually, actually I can see that. Uh, uh, well, did you dye your hair red again? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Come on, Dave. Uh, man, I love how awkward that uh, opening—not opening, but that scene in which the guy goes to pick up that date uh, where he wants to take pictures because. Taking pictures in high school for a dance, even if you're dating the person, is awkward with your parents because it's just the most, like... Forced. Yes, exactly. Forced thing ever. Let alone for just people who are, quote-unquote, dates for the night. And it's just, like, obviously as a parent, like, 
Not that I'm an adult. I totally get it. Like, you're just trying to make sure moments are captured. But, oh, boy. Is Especially that just... at that age. Yeah. You but... don't want those moments no, to be captured. No, you don't. I certainly don't want to remember. That was certain... also, I thought, my favorite line of the whole film. He was like, sorry, they didn't have any black flowers. That was actually great because it yeah. was a funny line. But then I kind of like the fact that she smiles because I think she kind of felt noticed in a way that, uh, you know, she probably wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I am fully assuming that she was not goth before no. the brother yeah. incident. That's that this is sure. just a, yep, um, a phase. Well, a phase. And well, I was going to say reaction. this is a reaction to yeah. uh, the brother's death. Yeah. So, whenever I think about her, I also think about Brent because I think they're on obviously a similar journey, not mm. in the movie, but just in their lives. Um, because I actually think one of the funnier jokes of the movie is actually emblematic of like the pain that's being endured, which is when um, Lola and her father scream at Brent, we can't hear you, because I think that's the nut, you know. That's his... so terrible. It oh. is. <laughs> I know, for them yeah. to uh, dye him up with that blue liquid so that he can't literally speak or shout, um, but then for them to mock him with that, because that's pretty clearly what he's dealing with at home, which I actually think is... Maybe the most underwritten character in the movie is the mother, for sure. Which is too bad, because I definitely think there's more there that we could have tapped into. Uh, but I will say, I don't think the mother ever comes off as someone who's making like all the wrong decisions and being a horrible person. It's just, unfortunately... How do you deal with that? Exactly. It's yeah. just her grief is hers, her son's grief is his, and they're not... But I do find that that final scene is actually pretty cathartic for myself, because we we're at least told uh, throughout the beginning that she's obviously upset for obvious reasons, a good reason, but that it's affecting her even everyday decisions, like letting her son in a car driven by another teen and or him or whatever. But at the end of the day, once even she's gone through the worryment of wondering if she's going to lose another person, the only thing she cares about is both. Not only is that her son is alive, but that the person he loves as well is too. And I actually very much kind of find catharsis in that hug. I would, I would agree with that. I, um, I think that um, something that I'm actually happy that the film uh, totally didn't even consider and actually makes that moment even better um, is to go off of something that I mentioned when we were watching that final scene play out. And I mean the Dino Moi scene of him arriving back at home and hugging his mom and everything is there is no even comment of his physical He's appearance. And, oh, oh, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say of his physical appearance yeah. as clearly he looks like John McClane yeah. at the end of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and some shit went down, and there's no comment on that. Just so thrilled that he is still alive and mm -hmm. that she can hold him in her arms and, yep. and that was that was that was a great choice absolutely um the last thing i want to say at least before mm -hmm. we go into the final ratings if mm -hmm. that's a thing that you're ready to do yet sure. but yeah. um is i do want to comment on the music in this movie oh okay yeah which is that i i love the music in this movie and here's what i'll say about it is that i actually think the music in any scene that it shows up is actually great because it supersedes the idea that music is only being chosen to fit a scene which is also a great way to do music in movies like that's totally valid but music is only listened to in this film and i think what's great is that every time music comes up it is completely believable that the character would listen to it and it is not i would say to the extent where you believe that the writer would be like oh he listens to heavy metal because he's angry. Like it felt slightly, even if that is end up ending up what happened, I, I still felt it slightly more organic. And I think it all becomes it stems from that opening scene. You have the father and son bonding over the uh, the tape deck, literally stuck in the father's car, and how this is old music and he can't get over it, you know, whatever. And yet the father taking uh, pleasure and relish in the fact that both is something that means something to him, but also is kind of pissing off his son in this fun moment. Which, uh, just to yeah. um, circle back to what you were talking about, about the son listening to heavy metal because he's angry, 
it is even confirmed in that first scene that he already does listen to heavy metal and it's yeah. not necessarily because he's depressed. Exactly. He's just listening to Slayer or whoever yep. because he's angry or whatever. No. Like he's just listening to the music he likes and it's just pushing even further on. Exactly. Because once uh, we're past the prologue, that's he's literally using music to drown out everything mm-hmm. else. And it happens to be heavy metal in that case. But he is no different from, let's, before I even get to the real showcase here, but, like, for example, his girlfriend who listens to a, kind of a pop song while she's getting ready for uh, the, the dance and whatnot. And, of course, uh, no different than our Lola, who listens to that Casey Chambers pop song, or country, I should say country pop song, uh, which is so great because it's very rare that I see a movie perfectly encapsulate how sometimes we internalize music as our own monologue, you know? Like, this is like a human, universal trait. Myself, I know I'm a victim of it. I know you are just because I know you're alive, Alex. (laughs) Which is that there are songs that speak to us on a primal level where we hear it and we're like, this is exactly what I feel, and that's why I'm going to listen to this on repeat. If if not literally, at least somewhat, but I have actually listened to songs on repeat. Sure, yeah. Uh, just to like get it out of my system or mm-hmm. whatever. And so for Lola's character to be so drawn to this, uh, you know, pop song that is so bland in its, uh, in, I don't know, interrogation, uh, you know, to literally go through the checklist of like, am I not pretty enough? You know, am I, is my heart too broken? Whatever. I love the idea that not only is she connected with the song, which, okay, that would be one thing, because I can see that. Like, why wouldn't, if someone is having trouble or mm. if they're socially ang- anxious or whatever, but not only that, but she's romanticized that song so much that she's become the victim of it because she also says that that would be the song that she would dance to with her future husband at a wedding, right? which makes no sense whatsoever. Right. <laughs> and I love that that, I feel like that's one of the most telling traits of her character, which is that she is so wrapped up in this narrative that she's built in her head, which we see throughout the entire movie, whether it's the literal fake uh, crowning of, at the dams or whatever, but also just the internalization of the fact that she somehow is a victim of everybody else's uh, pain, which we're really not led to believe is true at all. In fact, one of the great things I think about this movie is that when Brent's character rejects her to the dance, he doesn't do it with any malice, and he actually has a pretty valid reason, which is that he's dating somebody. So it's not like it's true revenge. It's Everything is in her head. Well, he's also at no point like high-fiving a bunch of bros being yeah. like, nah. Yeah, no. I nah. Mean, like, I mean, he's just like... Because I've seen horror movies where that's been kind of a thing. Uh, uh, yep. You know, like where that's, you know, I've been like, oh, I, they... I mean, I mean that's, a, that's a main part. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, it's not just dudes, but it's also females in the movie. Oh, yeah. Carrie, right? I mean, yeah, no, like Carrie is socially... Uh, yeah, that's social alienation. Yeah. Even more literally the movie Valentine from the 90s, I think, starring people like David Boreanaz and uh, Marley Shelton and a few others. Uh, that is literally about... Oh, Denise Richards basically rejects the guy in high school, but doesn't just reject him. Like, he asks her to the dance, and she basically doesn't say no. She says... Like, oh, you're the ugliest person I've ever seen, you know, to the point where, because that's a cheesy horror movie, you're like, you know what, she can die. Like, like it just, you know, it's so preposterous that it makes no sense. Yeah. And you're like, sure, why not? Whereas here, it just presents an unfortunate uh, <laughs> diversion of desires and interests that no sane person would ever confuse as malice. But, of course, she has because she believes in this narrative that... Also, she admits, at least halfway through the film, it's never going to come true because, uh, at least in her eyes, no one's going to match up with her daddy. Um, Which is probably part of what this uh, film is unfortunately getting at with her yes. character, is that is that she's got this uh, viewpoint of what her husband should be, and that viewpoint is based on her father and her yeah. father is a psychopath killer. So. Not only that, but really quickly also, let's mention, cause we haven't even mentioned it. It is kind of a little thing, but it's also a disturbing thing. 
she forces her father to basically give up any semblance of having a wife or a I think I mean I mean they do to her mother Yeah. what they do to all the exactly. other people yet they just don't throw her in the hole. No, so. they don't. But she also like literally like pulls her hair during the picture yeah. to try to get the father to go against her cuz he's like it's only a little flash like yeah. So the idea that she's so petty when it comes to her father's affection that mm-hmm. she can't even deal with the fact that, you know, obviously that he would have a wife or when he or when she forces him to answer, uh, you know, who's prettier. It's uh, it, it's that's where that's another moment where I'm just like, you know, the father is a psychopath, but also he, he raised an even bigger psychopath because she <laughs> has unfortunately got him under his uh, under her thumb. So yeah, yeah. Once you realize what her deal is going on on her forehead, and you realize that that's what's been happening to the others, uh, that's kind of disturbing. That they let her live like that. I mean, it's one thing to throw people down into there, which is obviously awful, but it's another thing to. I guess go about your business and pretend like they are a member of the family, despite the fact that you <laughs> have, uh, I don't know, brain them. So mm-hmm. anyway, let's go to final ratings. Uh, and I guess I'll go first. I actually am a big fan of this and I am interested in revisiting this. Uh, and I'm going to just go out and just give it a really solid rating on the first time through, which is four out of five. I know. I really liked wow. it. I thought this was really good. I will say, when I proposed this, I genuinely did think there was a good chance you were going to like it, mm-hmm. but I'm very happy to hear that you liked it. <laughs> I did. I, I, I really liked it. I mean, I think that this film uh, marries, I mean, the idea of just going the extra mile uh, with its characters and also at the same time being grounded. I mean... Um, I, I'm for whatever reason I I, I think it's probably because of the scenes with the family at the end, um, but I keep going back to the uh, Friedkin film Killer Joe. Oh, I'm thinking about is this. Is the finger licking good? Yeah. No, I mean that's literally pretty much uh, not shot for shot, but that's certainly a weird echo. <laughs> yeah, but obviously a lot of the moments that happen throughout that and the fucked up mentality in that film. Uh, is prevalent here as well, but yeah. we have this this really solid story also happening in the background, mm-hmm. and I mean, I was just a fan. I yeah. just thought this was a good film. I thought it had a very satisfying ending. I thought it was thought provoking. I thought that it had good comedic moments throughout. I just thought that start to finish, like this was a really solid film that I really enjoyed and. Also got a real reaction out of me. Uh, and I'm not saying that film should have to do that and it no. should make you squirm and make you scream and kick your legs up and down in the air or whatever, like I was doing. Uh, but also, um, I appreciate that it did. And at the same time, it did have this um, very real storyline behind it. So I was a big fan of uh, of this film in uh, four to five. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I give this a four and a half out of five. Yep. It's never going to be something that I consider to be some kind of masterpiece or perfect or anything like that. But I also feel like for what it is, it can do no wrong as is. Like you know, it it never attempts to be something more than the sum of its parts. Um, but what I find so uh, wonderful about it is that it is a weirdly easy movie to recommend, despite the fact that it has that kind of brutal torture porn element, which is Mm -hmm. that I feel like people, that's why I try not to say it up front, that that's a mode that it operates on because I do think that gives off the wrong connotations of what it might be because quality or not there's a difference between a movie like this and like Saw. (laughs) Like I can understand why any cinephile would think that all the Saw movies are the worst movies ever made, like you know, one through seven, even if I disagree with that. Um, whereas something like this, whether you like it or not, this is still technically grounded in a reality that is, is at least uh, 
within our reach that we can mm. latch on to, and I, and I very much appreciate it for that. So I I think the, the personal journey that the characters go on uh, is pretty great and gets so much mileage out of very little details and visual motifs, like I had mentioned with the car and the tree or him almost hitting his girlfriend. You know, like, that's kind of what makes this whole journey worth it. I also very much enjoy the, the the visceral brutality. Like some of those scenes are disgusting. Like I said to you that, and I still kind of stand by this. That honestly, the thing that disgusts me the most in this entire movie is the glitter. Like I <laughs> can't stand glitter in a normal context. So the idea of glitter just literally polluting the pool of blood over and the his foot. Is, yeah, is, uh, I know he's just very nonchalantly yeah. sprinkling the glitter while they not really dance, but kind of dance. Um, but for that pool of glitter in the blood of that surrounds his foot as a so, like, I'm more concerned about how much glitter is going to be on his body than I am about any long-term damage mm. of, that the knife may have done. So that says a lot about me, I'm sure. But <laughs> um, I, I just think this is a stellar movie throughout, and it's just a good example of, like, how I think horror is the best genre when it comes to going outside your comfort zone mm. of other countries or uh, just maybe the mentality of like straight to DVD because I genuinely think that in general horror is gets a bum rap and I used to be kind of part of it. But a lot of it's going to be pushed to the shelves and pushed to the side because the mainstream audience don't really want to see a movie like this, which I totally understand. Which means that there's so many hidden gems out there, and I think The Loved Ones absolutely is one of those hidden Yeah, gems. I mean, you talk about foreign filmmakers and um, just this genre having... And I, I'm thinking about foreign film... I mean, I'm thinking about easy things or comparing these, but foreign filmmakers and incestuous relationships, <laughs> and I immediately... my mind is drawn to old boy yeah um and that isn't necessarily like a horror film uh, I, but it falls yeah. in the genre for yeah, sure no, i was gonna say yeah mm-hmm. for so, sure uh, and that is a, a film that is uh if you want and i'm not talking about that terrible spike lee version that i've never watched and oh boy. don't really intend to and nah. so i guess i can't really say it's horrible but i'm pretty sure it is um but that original film there's so much going on there and if you just watch that start to finish and let the film play out as it is intended to, uh, oh boy, you are going to uh, be delivered a tale. <laughs> I agree. Uh, and before we close, I will say that I had mentioned on the previous podcast when I kind of hyped this movie up a little bit mm-hmm. that Sean Byrne had made a second feature, The Devil's Candy. Okay. Uh, I had mentioned on that episode, and I got two people from the 90s mixed up. I had said on that episode that it was Devin Sawa oh. from the Final Destination movie. Okay. I take that back because okay. I realized my mistake. Okay. It is Ethan Embry from like oh. uh, what's the movie you made me watch uh, with Jennifer Jennifer Love Hewitt oh Can't Hardly Wait yes that and a few other random movies now, I'm sorry that is a quintessential 90s movie no it is absolutely yeah um, but and I think he's a, I don't know if he's a quintessential 90s actor but certainly that's his era <laughs> no I mean he's in that he's in other terrible movies from yeah. that era like Vegas Vacation like he oh, shows yeah, that's up right. in, yeah yeah but randomly, he was in The Devil's Candy, which was a movie from about three or four years ago, and in a completely serious, but like he earns it, like he's actually good in it, and I was surprised. Uh, what not. Uh, just, uh, I know nothing about really the film, Yeah. Uh, but Ethan Embry, though, like he's kind of made a second career just doing random things like that. That's what it kind of seemed like when I was kind of browsing, because mm-hmm. uh, I, once I realized my second, I'm like, wait, who was in The Devil's Candy? And then I looked, and I was like, oh, and then I looked over at IMDb. And it's such a weird thing, because, like, and I, I haven't, like, watched his catalog or anything like that, but just looking at his credits, he's like living off the idea of him being that guy, but he's also doing things that are totally different. Yep. It's not like Robert Pattinson either. That is like people know him still from twilight, but he's doing these things that are like 
actual actor roles now oh, where, yeah. where this is a guy that was doing this 20 years ago mm-hmm. and now he's just like they're like oh you you we know you you yep. want to be in this for eight hundred thousand dollars fuck yeah i do no and and in the devil's candy he's like long-haired bearded oh really uh, wow. and he and so clearly this is a sean Byrne thing <laughs> he's a heavy metal fan okay in fact the devil's candy is basically i would say a heavy metal horror film hmm. uh which i think mean that you might enjoy it i don't think you'd like it as much as a loved one and i say that as someone who didn't like it as much as a loved one but i also very much enjoyed it uh but the weird two things about it one for anyone who likes heavy metal it is like a heavy metal horror film in a good way and uh two the villain of that movie is the i don't know if i would say villain but the kind of bad guy of the movie Identity by James Mangold oh. of the you know the big okay. guy who's playing in the it's hard to say if you haven't seen that movie but the uh, the prisoner on death row yep. let's put that mm-hmm. put it that way um, who famously in real life can uh, move his eyes separate from one another like uh, Bill Skarsgård and it apparently mm-hmm. uh, but anyway he plays the villain in the devil's candy uh, mm. it's a good movie I watched it for the first time this year but anyway uh, loved ones okay yeah uh, if you out there uh, have any thoughts, really on horror movies, because I'm assuming that most people uh, have not seen the loved ones, but you should. Uh, and uh, if you have any thoughts on that film or just horror in general, feel free to let us know your thoughts at filmtankshow at gmail dot com, or you can also try to catch us on Facebook, Twitter, or sort of on Instagram at Film Tank Show. Uh, and also, too, you can catch our episodes on our website, filmtankshow.com, or also on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or any of the other services where you can really find podcasts. We're, we're all over the place. Uh, just look for Film Tank. So, coming up on our episode with Sam and also Toussaint and myself and Nick, uh, we're going to talk about a classic film which is uh, the Sidney Lumet film, 12 Angry Men, from 1957, which is definitely a classic. Um, and Our, Ironically. I've never seen this from start to finish. Really? Uh, so I'm very Ooh, much looking forward to so it. So good. Yep. It, at one time, it was on my favorites, like all-time favorites list, mm-hmm. and I feel like it could be where I took it off for whatever reason. But I also feel like if I rewatch it, because it's been like and five we're going to talk years, about it, so yeah, I might just end up putting it back on my list. Mm-hmm. But ironically, we have done his first and last movie after that because his last movie was before the devil even knows you're dead. Oh, okay. And this was his first movie. That's a really wide range. Oh, absolutely, and yeah. especially if you watch everything in between, mm-hmm. like that's why he's actually one of my favorite directors because he. It's just so good. So many eras. Yeah, and yeah. so adaptive, too. It's not like in, like, before the devil knows you're dead, he's trying to recreate what he did or something like that in something like 12 Angry Men. Um, he's just, like, one of the, actually, one of the funny stories about before the devil knows you're dead is that Ethan Hawke and Philip Seymour Hoffman, for whatever reason, told him, like, not necessarily in private, but, like, took him aside and was like, I, you should really... Uh, shoot this in, on film because this kind of has that Scorsese, you know, crim, uh, criminal cinema element, whatever, which makes sense on paper, whatever. And he was just so kind of like, no, like, I, I think I can make this digital thing work. And obviously he did because I actually think that's a gorgeous movie in its mm-hmm. own way. But that's what I mean, like, where a filmmaker adapts to every era that it uh, that they're in. Mm. So, yeah. Good stuff. Well, yeah. looking forward to talking about 12 Angry Men coming up on episode 208. So, Nick, thanks a lot for being here. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, Alex. Well, it was wonderful as always. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to uh, catching up with everybody out there coming up on our next episode here on Film Tank. <laughs>